Welcome to Walking the Torah Portions. I'm Tyler Merwin, and this is Torah Portion, Vaishlach. Our Torah Portion this week starts in Genesis 32.3 and goes to 36.43. The half Torah is Obadiah 1.1 through 21. So Vaishlach means, and he sent. And it starts off with, it says, And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir. So where it says, And Jacob sent actually would have just said, and he sent. So this week's Torah portion starts out with Jacob sending some messengers ahead to Esau as he and his family are returning back from Haran. But let's back up and read from the beginning of the chapter 32 in last week's portion and continue into the beginning of this week's Torah portion to get a little context. So Genesis 32, 1 through 7 reads, And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you. And there are four hundred men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. What I wanted to point out here is that the angels that met Jacob and the messengers that he sent to Esau are the same Hebrew word malach, which is Strong's H4397. We discussed before that this Hebrew word means messenger or ambassador and can mean angelic messengers like angels, but it can also be just people. So in the context of verse 1 and 2, it's pretty clear that in the that we're actually dealing with the angelic pipe, the angels. But in verses 3 and 6, it could be angels or it could actually be human messengers. So the angels that met him in the camp in verse 1 could have gone out on that mission to bring word to Esau in verse 3. But Jacob could have also sent human messengers from his own company on that same mission. So which is it? Who went out to Esau? The answer is we really don't know. The sages of, old, sages of old are even split on what their interpretation is. So in verse 4, in Jacob's message to Esau, he states that he has sojourned with Laban. This is thought to convey to Esau that Jacob was an alien in the land of Haran and that he had not become some great exalted prince. He was blessed but wasn't coming to be honored by his brother because of his great status. Let's remember the blessing that Jacob got from his father Isaac when Isaac actually thought that he was blessing Esau. In Genesis 27, 29, Let the people serve you, and let nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Curse be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. So Jacob is telling Esau, I'm not the man, or at least not yet, and I don't come expecting you to bow down to me. So his message is delivered, and Jacob is told that Esau is coming to meet him with 400, with 400 men with him, not the greeting party that Jacob was looking forward to. So this news frightens Jacob, and we read in 32, 7 and 8, he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels, into two camps, thinking, 
If Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. Jacob then prays to God. He acknowledges that he left Haran with just himself and his staff, and now he is, he is big enough to be divided into two camps. I think this may be a prophecy of Israel, who is Jacob, dividing into the northern and the southern kingdoms where the one staff becomes two. Jacob prays for deliverance from the hand of Esau, and he reminds God of his promises. He then sends an elaborate tribute to his brother in separated groups with hope that this would begin to soften Esau's heart. For he says in verse 20, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterward I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. As his tribute heads towards his brother and his wives and possessions are sent across the river Jabbok, Jacob stays back at camp where he ends up in a strange wrestling match. So Jacob wrestles with the mysterious angel and prevails, even though his hip is put out of joint. Jacob won't let go until he is blessed, and the angel says to him in verse 27 and 28, And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Yisrael, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So who is this mysterious angel? Some sages believe this is the guardian angel of Esau. It's believed that all nations have an angel that guides its destiny and is kind of the intermediary between that nation and the Holy One himself. The only nation that doesn't have a guardian angel is Israel because God himself watches over his people and their destiny. Esau would have an angel because he would become the nation of Edom. In a spiritual sense, Edom, or the Red One, would epitomize the spiritual force that is always fighting against God's people, Israel. As Jacob approaches Esau, it's actually Jacob who is bowing to his brother, in fact, seven times. When the brothers finally do meet, we read in 33, 4, But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. In the physical Torah scroll, where we see the phrase, and kissed him, the text has an odd feature. This phrase has dots on top of it, atop all the letters. So if you ever see in a Torah scroll, you'll see that they, there's all kinds of little marks most of the time to, to have cantillation, vowel points, and things like that. That's not those marks. These are just actually dots directly over every letter. So it's just something that's kind of odd. There's a lot of other things in the Torah scroll too. We'll find later there's enlarged letters, there's letters that are small, there's letters that are upside down, and even sometimes backwards. This is meant to somehow show that there's a hidden illusion. Some sages think this is telling us that Esau was not sincere in his acceptance of, I, of Jacob. Other sages feel that this is actually expressing a true change of heart within Esau himself. So after this peaceful reunion with his brother, the two head off in their own directions. Jacob's first stop after his encounter with Esau is Sukkot. Now, in my ESV translation, it says Sukkoth or Sukkoth, and I think that's the way it is in most of the English translations. This is the first mention of Sukkot in Scripture. It's interesting that after Jacob is delivered from Esau by the hand of Adonai, that his first stop is Sukkot. Later in Exodus, when Israel is delivered by the hand of God from Egypt and Pharaoh, their first stop is Sukkot. You can find that in Exodus 12, 37. Sukkot is also the last feast day on God's calendar of holy days and is usually translated as tabernacles or booths. And it's defined as temporary dwellings, tents, or booths. So Jacob moves on from Sukkot on to Shechem, into the land of Canaan. And here we read, 
in Genesis 34, 1 through 4. Now Dina, the daughter of Leah, who she had born to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dina, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. So Israel's daughter Dina is abducted very soon after arriving back to the promised land. Let's keep reading. In 34, 5 through 7, it says, Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dina, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they had heard it, and the men were indignant and very angry, because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. As the story continues, Shechem and Hamor plead to Jacob to let Hamor marry Dina and express they will pay whatever Jacob wishes. We pick up in verse 13. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully, because he had defiled their sister Dina. They said, to him, they said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you that you will become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Shechem and Hamor are pleased with the offer and convince every male in the whole city of Shechem to become circumcised. This is a hint to us about how prosperous Jacob was that an entire city was willing to endure circumcision just to become one with Jacob's clan. But in verse 25 through 29, we read, On the third day, when they were sore, the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword, and took Dina out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city, because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives, all that was in the houses they captured and plundered. The commentary says that the plan was just to rescue Dina, from her captivity on that third day, but that Simeon and Levi decided amongst themselves to kill all the males and to plunder the city. Jacob is very displeased with Simeon and Levi, but they stand up for themselves for defending their sister's honor. So how do you think this should have been handled? Circumcision is a sign of the covenant with God Almighty and such things should not be used for deception or a means to get revenge, even if it's to bring about righteous justice. In Genesis 49, at the end of Jacob's life, he speaks prophetically about all the tribes, and he says about Simeon and Levi in 49, 5-7, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel, O oh, my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their will, willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So God then tells Jacob to arise and go to Bethel, or Beit El. While there, God appears to him again and affirms the blessing given to him by the angel that he wrestled, that his name would be Israel. He also reaffirms the patriarchal 
patriarchal blessings that were given to Abraham and to Isaac. So they journeyed from Beit El when Rachel goes into labor. She dies in childbirth and names the baby Ben-Oni, which means, in, is translated, son of mourning or son of sorrow. But Jacob renames him Ben-Yamin, which means son of strength, or literally, son of my right hand. So Rachel is buried between Beit El, which is the house of God, and Beit Lechem, or as we're more familiar, Bethlehem, which is the house of bread. Israel continued and settled outside of Bethlehem. After this, we read in Genesis 35, 22, While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. The commentary says that after Rachel's death, Jacob moved his primary residence from Rachel's tent into the tent of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaiden. It goes on to say that Reuben actually took Jacob's bed out of Bilhah's tent and put it in Leah's tent. Reuben was jealous for his mother Leah and the attention from Jacob that she never got. This account will also be brought back later in Genesis 49. And at the end of this chapter we read, Genesis 35, 27 through 29, and Jacob came to his father Isaac in Bamri, in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last. And he died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So Jacob meets his father Isaac at Hebron where he dies, the same place the other patriarchs and matriarchs are buried. Jacob and Esau together bury their father. Then we get to chapter 36 that is devoted to the genealogy of Esau. As it says in 36.1, these are the generations of Esau, that is Edom. The Torah keeps reinforcing to us that Esau is Edom, the red one. Being a son of Isaac, though, his descendants are memorialized in Scripture, just as Ishmael and his descendants were in the previous sections. So let's remember that the promises we have from God are for good, and let's not be fearful of the Red One, for His plans will not succeed against those who are in Messiah. I pray that this teaching has been edifying to you, Let's lift up the name of the Holy One with love and echad. Shalom.